Hi, I'm Sarah. This is Hardcover Hearts. And I'm here with my week of reading wrap up where I talk about the books that I read, what I'm currently reading and what I potentially could read next week. I had an okay reading week. Uh, most of them I finished this weekend. I, I seem to uh, not be able to read a lot during the week, but make up for it on Friday night, Saturday and today on Sunday. So let me sh jump right in and show you what I have finished. So the first book that I read this week uh, is inspired by a read I did uh, with a lovely group of people. Uh, this is Tomb of Sand by Jintinjali Shri and translated by Daisy Rockwell. And this won the Booker International last year. Uh, it was through reading this book that I realized I am woefully ignorant about the partition. So the partition is the situation, is the event where India was broken up into two different countries uh, for religious sects. And so Hindus were given India and Muslims were given Pakistan. And this happened in the, in, in the 40s, I think late 40s. And it was uh, a part of Br the British moving out of and leaving India, uh, a country that they had colonized for many, many years. This book really took a very interesting modern day uh, approach at thinking about the impacts of the partition and it made me want to read more. So with that in mind, so this is Independence by Chita Banerjee Deva Karuni. And it in essence is a story of three sisters. So you've got this very close knit family in a village in Bengal and the father is a doctor and he's been serving the community, very kind hearted, is kind of like the glue that holds not only their family together, but also very important for the community. Uh, he has very close friends, and very strong ties. And of the three girls, uh, his oldest Deepa wants to be just like him. She wants to study medicine. She's fascinated with what he can do. Very intellectually curious, very, very smart. Uh, the next is Priya and Priya is beautiful and she wants to marry well and um, she's very romantic, uh, maybe a little flighty, maybe a little unrealistic, uh, but that's her. And then the last sister is Jamani and Jamani is kind of unseen. She's um, the one that no one really pays attention to. She's the one who's most dutiful, uh, but as a means of trying to be seen. Um, and she holds deep, deep, deep feelings, including some very strong resentments. Uh, they are, they grow up before the partition and are witness to the type of turmoil that, that happens in their in their community, in their neighborhood, uh, in their, their area of the country and in the country itself. As the partition uh, discussions start to ripple through India. In a riot, her father is killed and it is left to the three girls and their mother to figure out what they're gonna do with their future. And everything feels very, very precarious. I don't want to say too much more, except that each each daughter's future changes uh, from where the trajectory from where they thought it was going to go. And I found myself invested with the characters. I was invested in their relationships. I was invested in their future and interested in the setting and the backdrop of what was going on in India at the time. Uh, so it was uh, very simply told. There wasn't um, a ton of flowery language. I don't think it was overly melodramatic, but there was definitely drama, which I think makes sense for uh, the situation and the events that that took place. Uh, so I liked it. I thought it was I thought it was good. Then after that, I found this in audio. This is my trick. Um, so some people have asked me how I read so much, and that is I always have the next books lined up. And so, uh, but it, I don't necessarily have the very next one, but I have a range of books ready to go. Sometimes um, 
I don't, the same doesn't happen with audiobooks. So, uh, what ends up happening is that I leverage like the library gods, as I call them, uh, for my holds to come up or whatever's available at the moment that was already on my holds list and I just grab it. But that can lead to some chaos a, a little bit. And if I can't find anything, if there's nothing that's available at that moment that I, that's really calling me, I would just turn to my my gold standards, which are a continuation of a series, usually a mystery series. Um, uh, historical fiction is always is always a good place for me to land. But but those are typically my go to's. Uh, in this case, I wanted to try the second in a, a new to me author, uh, and that is uh, Nikki French. This is the second. It's Tuesdays Gone in the Frida Klein series. I, uh, although I liked this, I think this is going to have to be where, where Frida Klein and I part ways and not because it's not good, uh, but because it's getting into the, uh, the exact areas that I don't like, uh, which is the thriller components. So the story is, uh, we've got Frida Klein, who is a psychotherapist, psychoanalyst who lives in London and she is independent. Uh, very interesting woman. She's got very strong friendships, a strong sense of, of uh, connection with uh, some very important people in her life. But she also is very inquisitive and uh, just wants to help people, and wants to figure things out, uh, even if it comes at her peril. Uh, she is called on to a case where a social worker went to check on a woman who was uh, released back into, into society and the woman had ha been having some mental challenges. Um, she goes to visit her at the place that she's staying and she hadn't been able to see her in a while because of backlog. And when she gets there, she realizes that something is very, very not right. And she's invited in and while she, when she goes into the salon or living room, she sees that there is a man who's been dead for a very, very long time propped up. And the woman doesn't have seem to have a sense that this <laughs> uh, that the man's dead. Um, he's not talking to her. They're not carrying on a conversation. So she's uh, completely uh, beyond uh, beyond sanity at this stage. So Frida's called in to talk to the woman to meet her to provide an assessment for the police because she helped on a previous case. And it's in trying to understand the woman, she wants to understand more about the case. She kind of gets pulled into the case and it uh, turns out that this man was a very successful con artist who would manipulate people, manipulate women. Uh, he was someone who's really good at listening and she sees some parallels between herself and him. Uh, mostly uh, when she's talking to the victims and they say, yeah, he was really easy to talk to, like you. <laughs> so that's gonna be an odd feeling, right? Uh, you know, she solves the case. It's really well done. It's very smart, very smart. I like all of the psychological aspects and elements to it. But what I don't like is it's a continuation of a storyline that was started in the first book that's continuing on. And I just now I know it's going to be a cat and mouse kind of chase uh, moving forward. And it's just not something that I enjoy. I don't like it at all. So I think we're parting ways. No harm, no foul. This was I, I enjoyed the first two. Um, but yeah, no more for me. Then I finished this. I'm, I'm in love with the series. This is The Belly of Paris by Emile Zola, translated by Brian Nelson. This is the third of Le Rougon Maca series by Zola. And this one is sent in La Haye, which is the new market that was, that was made uh, during uh, How Baron Haussmann's uh, reformulation of Paris, where they kind of really rethought what Paris should be, tore down all sorts of, of housing and all sorts of parts of the of, of what Paris used to be in order to create these grand boulevards and this new scheme of, of Paris. This is all about gluttony. And because this is the market, uh, this is the food market. So all of the writing is uh, 
it's either two extremes. It's either sumptuous, uh, gorgeous, uh, you know, mouth watering uh, of of all of these ingredients of these uh, food stalls of just tumbling over with fresh produce. So it's either this sumptuous, delicious, you can almost smell, you can almost see everything, to then also this overabundance creating this rot, this decomposition, this uh, the flies and the smell and the heat uh, of, of what's spoiling. So it's very much uh, this story of excess. So we have our main character, Florent. Florent was arrested in the coup d'etat that saw Napoleon put on the throne. He was sent to Devil's Island and actually was able to escape and make his way back. So he's a fugitive and um, he's hoping to kind of stay under the radar. Uh, he makes it back to Paris. He finds his younger brother. His younger brother, while he was uh, kind of away in exile on Devil's Island, his younger brother was being raised by their very wealthy uncle. He was a shopkeeper. He had a butcher shop and um, sold to, to the public. And he just ended up teaching his nephew and his nephew uh, was brought on and took it over when he passed away. And we also have Lisa Macar of the Ruga Macar. So this is her, uh, where she shows up in this story. And she is uh, brought on as a shop girl and kind of raised up uh, alongside the brother. And they end up falling in, falling in love. They end up coming up with an arrangement and sharing the inheritance and opening this shop. So when Florent comes back, he finds his brother well-established and his brother immediately takes him in because he remembers Florent working so hard to make sure that, that he had everything that he needed as a child. Uh, Florent is nervous. He doesn't want to go back to jail, uh, but he also is very politically minded and uh, starts to go out with some friends and meet some people who are uh, frothing at the mouth and fomenting uh, revolutionary ideas. Meanwhile, his sister-in-law has tried to give him kind of give him his inheritance and send him on his way or his share of it and send him on his way. But she also realizes it would be better if he stays so she can keep the money and actually not give it to him. And so she, he ends up living with them uh, kind of begrudgingly. And eventually they find him a scheme to take over as a substitute this old inspector's job. The inspector is dying, and so he is given the inspector's job just to kind of do it for a while until this man can come back. The man's not coming back. He's old. So he ends up being an inspector in the marketplace, kind of uh, going on to the other side and becoming the law of this marketplace. Now, the politics and the culture of the market itself is phenomenal and so much about how it's run by the women who have their individual uh, shops. It, so much detail, so much rich information about how life was lived in, in for, these, for these people is, is in here. This was fantastic, but I continue to be incredibly impressed with, with the Rugamaka series. Can't wait to start the next one. Then the last book, we just did the check-in today. So when this goes up tomorrow, we will have all weighed in on the last of our novels for the Shirley Hazard project. So I think I've made mention that I'm doing kind of author deep dives with a group of people as group read projects. Uh, Shirley Hazard is what we're working on now. Uh, coming up will be Helen DeWitt, uh, and that information I'll put below. We're gonna do that from August through October, uh, reading her works. I think there was a fairly unanimous feeling that this was not her strongest work, even though this is the one that got, was most lauded and uh, received the most awards. But for sure, the Transit of Venus is the more tightly a thoughtfully crafted novel. This was a little looser. It didn't have the same type of intentionality and potentially uh, her story, her personal story might be more interwoven in this, hence uh, why maybe um, 
what she may have thought was obvious doesn't come through to us. This is really about displacement. And this is right out right after World War II. And we have uh, we have Leith, uh, who is a translator. He is a historian. He's a writer. And he has been walking across China uh, with the language and trying to understand what's going on in China and write books about, about it, about the culture and the landscape and the country. He's in Japan. And he is there to do something similar. This is right after the war. So there are a lot of Americans and he is bunked with some Australian, an Australian family. And he, they live in one house and he lives in a separate one. And he's kind of their guest. While he's there, he meets uh, these two teenagers who are brother and sister. And uh, there's Benedict and Helen. Uh, they're precocious. They're very, very, very smart. They're also incredibly sad. Uh, Benedict is obviously incredibly ill and really shunned by the parents. The parents are fairly horrible people. Uh, and the, the daughter, Helen, uh, Benedict's sister, has really been his sole companion. And they, they stick together and they have been shuttled all around the world together uh, without the supervision of the parents, but kind of in other people's um, guidance. And then we have Peter and Peter is someone who Leif has saved and one of his, someone who was in the war with him. So they have a very tight bond. And we learn about Peter, the chapters that he features in really tell a different story in India and other parts of the world uh, while Leif is in Japan. So we have all of these characters who are uh, in essence, shell-shocked at the end of the war that are in different parts of the world uh, and the world no longer really makes sense. They are, they are forever changed. Home doesn't hold the same understanding as it used to. And I think the horrors of what they've seen are, are still kind of raging within them. Uh, uh, there's also a love story in here, but for me, the love story did not ring true. Um, and was a little morally suspect, more than a little. <laughs> so, so for me, I, I, this is not her strongest work. Still, she's an amazing writer, an amazing writer. A lot of phenomenal ideas, uh, but overall, not the strongest work. Uh, for me, that would be The Bay of Noon, I think might, might be my favorite because it deals with two women, uh, two strong women in their relationship. Uh, and then uh, the transit of Venus. So yeah, this was a little bit of a bummer, but to read it with other people was fantastic. So that's what I read. What I'm currently reading, y'all, I'm struggling. I'm struggling. I'm still making my way through Paris stories, but I'm not called back to it. And this is the problem I feel with short stories is that you're supposed to read them slowly but I just am not the type of person that gets, uh, that feels drawn back to a short story collection. So I keep forgetting <laughs> that I need to read it. Um, and her writing, this is, I'm uh, sorry, this is Paris Stories by Mavis Gallant. Let me show you that. Um, and her writing is very sophisticated. It's very beautiful, but it, it, it is very removed. I don't, uh, it's intellectual. It's very smart, but I'm lacking some vibrancy. Um, I'm lacking some vibrancy in it, a, um, a heartbeat or some passion, um, some beauty. Uh, it, it's more cerebral than it is uh, physical. And, and I think that's maybe what's also not pulling me back. I'll continue. And I think this is something that I might try to keep com coming back to here and there. Um, I want to... But I, I have to admit, there have been some that I just couldn't get into and I just skipped the story. Uh, am I allowed to do that? <laughs> I mean, I'm a grown woman. I can do what I want. But I would like to know, how, do you do that with short story collections? If you're not, if you're not enjoying a short story, do you DNF it like you DNF a book? I, I would love to know. Then uh, I just finished this, but I can't say anything yet because I'm reading this with Leo from Leo's Little Book Life and he hasn't checked in uh, on the final bit yet. So hold for this for next week. This is South Riding. Uh, this is by Winifred Holtby and it is just divine. 
It's so divine. I'm, I'm just going to, that's all I'm going to say. I will come back next week and I'll tell you all about it. Also reading this for my In Real Life book club. And, oh, I'm just completely absorbed with it. This is The Marriage Portrait by Maggie O'Farrell. Gorgeous cover. This is one of those situations where I actually waited and bought the U.S. cover because I liked it so much more than I liked the the UK cover, which is not usually the case with me. Um, Maggie O'Farrell just knows, she just knows how to write. Uh, for me, it's, I, I love it. And this feels even smoother than Hamnet. Hamnet felt a little set piecey, uh, you know, where you'd have a scene and then a dramatic change in scene. And so it felt very much like a play. Uh, this just reads just, just effortlessly. So, so good. So enjoying this so far. Of course, I need to continue with the Rougal Maca series. This is a over a year project, so it's 20, 20 um, novels. So I'm gonna jump straight into the next one. This is The Conquest of Plessin, and this actually is translated by uh, Helen Constantine, not Brian Nelson, who did such a phenomenal job. So I'm hoping I enjoy this one. Then I, I, I this one's calling out to me, it's very small. This is Emmy Yagi's Diary of a Boy, translated by David Boyd and Lucy North. And I hear this is phenomenal. I just love this cover. My understanding is this is about a woman who fakes pregnancy at work, um, thinking that it's gonna make it easier, that she, so it'll make the situation easier, but it kind of backfires on her. So we'll see how that one turns out. And then this one just looks phenomenal. This is Forbidden Notebook by Alba de Cepedes and translated by Anne Goldstein, forward by Jumpa Lahiri. So that means it's an Italian novel. And yeah, it just looks really, just looked really good. It's about a woman who is trying to kind of rewrite her life and uh, rethink it. So yeah, I'm always here for that. And then with the Shirley Hazard Project, now that we finished uh, her novels, we're gonna move on to this. And this is her short story collection. I told you, I, apparently this is my year of short stories. Uh, this is Collected Stories and it has uh, three, three sections to it. The first section is Cliffs of Fall, which is one of her collected books. The other one is People in Glass Houses. And then it is uncollected and unpublished. And so those three sections have a bunch of just different short stories underneath it. I just love this cover. So that's it. That's all. I think I've got plenty to keep me busy. I would love to know, have you read any of these and what were your thoughts? And that's it for me for now. I hope you have a great reading week and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.